And this is VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today, Dan Novak tells us about a water crisis facing Indonesia's Bali. Brian Lin presents this week's science report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series, the making of a nation. But first, here is Dan Novak. Bali, Indonesia. Is facing a worsening water crisis from tourism development, population growth, and water mismanagement. Shortages already are affecting UNESCO World Heritage structure, food production, and Balinese culture. Experts warn the situation will worsen if existing water control policies are not enforced across the island. It is no longer possible to work in the fields as a farmer," said Farmer E. Katut Jata. He said the land is too dry to grow rice, which he sells to provide for his family. Bali is in the center of Indonesia's group of islands. Bali gets its water from three main sources: lakes, rivers, and groundwater. A traditional irrigation system. Called the Subak, sends water through a network of waterways, dams, and tunnels. The Subak was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2012. The system is central to Balinese culture. It represents the Balinese Hindu idea of harmony between people, nature, and spirituality. This is one of the very special cases of living landscapes in Asia," said Feng Jing, who works with UNESCO in Bangkok. But demand is putting severe pressure on the Subak and other water resources," said Putubawa. He is with the Bali Water Protection Program. The island's population increased by more than 70 percent from 1980 to 2020, to 4.3 million people, found government data. Tourism growth has been even greater. Less than 140,000 foreign visitors came to the island in 1980. By 2019, there were more than 6.2 million foreign and 10.5. Million Indonesian tourists. Bali's economy has done very well with tourism, but at a cost. Rice fields, where the Subak once ran through, have been turned into golf courses and water parks. Forests that naturally collect water for the Subak have been destroyed for new homes and hotels, Bawa said. Stroma Cole is with the University of Westminster in London. She has researched tourism's impact on Bali's water supplies. Cole said the water table is also dropping because people and businesses use private wells instead of government-owned supplies. The water table is the upper level of an underground surface in which rocks or soil. Are always surrounded by water. In less than ten years, Bali's water table has sunk more than fifty meters in some areas. Wells are becoming dry, or have been damaged with salt water, especially in the islands south. Bali does have rules like water permits and taxes on water used. They are meant to control the island's water supplies, but there is no enforcement," Cole said. The serious effect of the water crisis 
can be seen in Jatilawi, in northwestern Bali. The area has the island's largest rice farms. For generations, farmers used the Subak system for irrigation. But in the last 19 years, farmers have had to pump water through white plastic pipes to irrigate the fields. Some Bali farmers say they can only get one rice harvest a year instead of two or three because of limited water supplies, Cole's research found. That could reduce food production on the island. When Indonesia closed its borders during the pandemic, Bali's tourism greatly dropped. Environmental activists hoped the closure would help raise water levels in the wells. But development across the island has continued, including a new road that activists say will further affect the Subak system. New hotels, homes, and other businesses are also adding to the demand. Bawa said tourism is important to Bali, but there also should be better enforcement and increased monitoring to protect the island's water resources. We need to do this together for the sake of the survival of the island. I'm Dan Novak. Next is this week's science report with Brian Lynn. Be sure to listen closely. There will be a quiz question for you after we hear the report. New research shows that the Tonga volcano sent large amounts of particles and water vapor into the upper reaches of Earth's atmosphere. Scientists used satellite equipment to measure the plume created by the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hayapai undersea volcano. The blast or eruption of the volcano happened in January in the South Pacific near the island nation of Tonga. The ten-minute eruption caused a series of large ocean waves, known as a tsunami, to hit areas around the world. The huge plume the volcano created included smoke, gas, and water vapor. Researchers at Britain's University of Oxford studied the size of the plume and examined data showing how high it reached into the sky. They reported in a recent study in the publication Science, the volcano produced the highest ever reported plume. The plume was the first. To have broken through to the mesosphere level or layer of Earth's atmosphere, the scientists said, the mesosphere is the third highest layer of Earth's atmosphere above the stratosphere and the troposphere, which starts at the Earth's surface. The mesosphere rises to eighty-five kilometers high. Meteors burn up within this layer. The Oxford scientists said images captured by satellites suggested the volcano's plume reached fifty-seven kilometers into the sky. They said the previous record holder was Mount Pinatubo, which erupted in nineteen ninety-one. That volcano created a plume recorded as high as forty kilometers. It's the first time we've ever recorded a volcanic plume reaching the mesosphere," said Simon Proud, a scientist at Oxford and Britain's scientific research centre, Rawl Space. Proud added that the only other volcanic plume that might have reached the mesosphere 
might have been released in the eruption in 1883 of Krakatau, a small volcanic island in Indonesia. But we didn't see that in enough detail to confirm, he said. The researchers said progress in observational technology helped them reach their findings. The team used a method known as the parallax effect to measure the volcano's plume. The parallax effect describes a difference in the apparent position of an object when it is seen along two different lines of sight. The scientists said they used the parallax effect to examine the images captured from above by satellites. Proud said his team was helped by satellites that recorded images every ten minutes after the eruption, permitting them to document quick changes in the plume's movements. Thirty years ago, when Pinatubo erupted, our satellites were nowhere near as good as they are now, he said. They could only scan the Earth every thirty minutes, or maybe even every hour. In a separate study, NASA researchers reported in August that the Tonga volcano also blasted a huge amount of water vapor into Earth's atmosphere. The space agency researchers said the vapor reached into the stratosphere, which stretches 50 kilometers high. But the amount of water vapor blasted into the atmosphere would have been enough to fill more than 58,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. We've never seen anything like it, said Luis Milan, an atmospheric scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. Milan examined data from an instrument on NASA's Aura satellite, which measures atmospheric gases, including water vapor. After the Tonga volcano erupted, NASA scientists started seeing extremely high vapor readings. The NASA study, published in Geophysical Research Letters, estimated the plume injected an amount of vapor equal to about 10% of the water that already existed in the stratosphere. That was nearly four times the amount of water vapor scientists estimate the Mount Pinatubo eruption sent into the stratosphere, the researchers said. NASA said the large amount of water vapor could have been enough to temporarily affect Earth's average temperature. This is because water vapor traps heat. However, the team noted that this effect would disappear over time when the extra water vapor cycles out of the stratosphere. This means the presence of the water vapor would not be enough to greatly affect climate change. I'm Brian Lynn. Now, here is a question for you to try to answer. What did Simon Proud say about how satellite technology has improved observations of volcanic eruptions? Is it A, satellites can operate in much more extreme conditions, B, satellites can provide real-time pictures of a volcanic event, or C, satellites can record images much more frequently. The answer is C. You can answer more questions about this week's science report by visiting our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. episode of Newswords. Newswords is a weekly one-minute video program that explains a vocabulary word you may have come across in recent news stories. Hi, Katie. 
Hi, Ashley. So, what will this week's news word be? Ashley, I'm not going to just come out and say it. I'll give you some clues, though. Fine. Let's hear some clues. It is something that many people do this time of year to prepare for the holidays. It involves putting up things inside or outside of your home, such as bright lights and colorful displays. It can be a lot of work, but it also brings people joy. Is it a verb? Yes, it is a verb. Okay, I think I have an idea of what it might be, but I will keep my guess to myself. If you think you know what word Katie is describing, write to us at learningenglishvoanews.com. You can take a look at the video on our website and on social media Thursday. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Katie. My pleasure, Ashley. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American history in VOA Special English. Just before sunrise on April twelfth, eighteen sixty-one, the first shot was fired in the American Civil War. A heavy mortar roared, sending a shell high over the harbor at Charleston, South Carolina. The shell dropped and exploded above Fort Sumter. A United States military base on an island in the harbor. The explosion was a signal for all Confederate guns surrounding the fort to open fire. Shell after shell smashed into the fort. The booming of the cannons woke the people of Charleston. They rushed to the harbor and cheered as the bursting shells lighted the dark sky. Jack Moyles and Stuart Spencer tell about the attack on Fort Sumter. Confederate leaders ordered the attack after President Abraham Lincoln refused to withdraw the small force of American soldiers at Sumter. Food supplies at the fort were very low, and Southerners expected hunger would force the soldiers to leave. But Lincoln announced. He was sending a ship to Fort Sumter with food. Confederate President Jefferson Davis ordered his commander in Charleston, General Beauregard, to destroy the fort before the food could arrive. The attack started from Fort Johnson, across the harbor from Sumter. A Virginia congressman, Roger Pryor, was visiting Fort Johnson. When the order to fire was given, the fort's commander asked Pryor if he would like the honor of firing the mortar that would begin the attack. No, answered Pryor, and his voice shook. I cannot fire the first gun of the war. But others could, and the attack began. At Fort Sumter. Major Robert Anderson and his men waited three hours before firing back at the Confederate guns. Anderson could not use his most powerful cannons; they were in the open, at the top of the fort, where there was no protection for the gunners. Too many of his small force would be lost if he tried to fire these guns. So Anderson had his men fire the smaller cannon from better protected positions. These, however, did not do much damage to the Confederate guns. The shelling continued all day. A big cloud of smoke rose high in the air over Fort Sumter. The smoke was seen by United States Navy ships. A few miles outside Charleston Harbor, they had come with the ship bringing food for the men at Sumter. 
There were soldiers on these ships, but they could not reach the fort to help Major Anderson. Confederate boats blocked the entrance to the harbor, and Confederate guns could destroy any ship that tried to enter. The commander of the naval force, Captain Fox, had hoped to move the soldiers to Sumter in small boats, but the sea was so rough that the small boats could not be used. Fox could only watch and hope for calmer seas. Confederate shells continued to smash into Sumter throughout the night and into the morning of the second day. The fires at Fort Sumter burned higher and smoke filled the rooms where soldiers still tried to fire their cannons. About noon, three men arrived at the fort in a small boat. One of them was Louis Wigfall, a former United States senator from Texas, now a Confederate officer. He asked to see Major Anderson. I come from General Beauregard, he said. It is time to put a stop to this, sir. The flames are raging all around you, and you have defended your flag bravely. Will you leave, sir? Wigfall asked. Major Anderson was ready to stop fighting. His men had done all that could be expected of them. They had fought well against a much stronger enemy. Anderson said he would surrender if he and his men could leave with honor. Wigfall agreed. He told Anderson to lower his flag and the firing would stop. Down came the United States flag and up went the white flag of surrender. The battle of Fort Sumter was over. More than 4,000 shells had been fired during the 33 hours of fighting, but no one on either side was killed. One United States soldier, however, was killed the next day when a cannon exploded as Anderson's men prepared to leave the fort. The news of Anderson's surrender reached Washington late Saturday, April 13th. President Lincoln and his cabinet met the next day and wrote a declaration that the president would announce on Monday. In it, Lincoln said powerful forces had seized control in seven states of the South. He said these forces were too strong to be stopped by courts or policemen. Lincoln said troops were needed. He requested that the states send him 75,000 soldiers. He said these men would be used to get control of forts and other federal property seized from the Union. Lincoln knew he had the support of his own party. He also wanted Northern Democrats to give him full support. So Sunday evening, a Republican congressman visited the top Democrat of the North, Senator Stephen Douglas. The congressman urged Douglas to go to the White House and tell Lincoln that he would do all he could to help put down the rebellion in the South. At first, Douglas refused. He said Lincoln had removed Democrats, friends of his, from government jobs, and had given the jobs to Republicans. Douglas said he didn't like this. Anyway, he said, Lincoln probably did not want his advice. The congressman, George Ashman, urged Douglas to forget party politics. He said Lincoln and the country needed the senator's help. Douglas finally agreed to talk with Lincoln. He and Ashman 
went immediately to the White House. Lincoln welcomed his old political opponent. He explained his plans and read to Douglas the declaration he would announce the next day. Douglas said he agreed with every word of it, except, he said, 75,000 soldiers would not be enough. Remembering his problems with Southern extremists, he urged Lincoln to ask for 200,000 men. He told the president, You do not know the dishonest purposes of those men as well as I do. Lincoln and Douglas talked for two hours. Then the senator gave a statement for the newspapers. He said he still opposed the administration on political questions, but, he said, he completely supported Lincoln's efforts to protect the Union. Douglas was to live for only a few more months. He spent this time working for the Union. He traveled through the states of the Northwest, making many speeches. Douglas urged Democrats everywhere to support the Republican government. He told them, There can be no neutrals in this war, only patriots or traitors. Throughout the North, thousands of men rushed to answer Lincoln's call for troops. Within two days, a military group from Boston left for Washington. Other groups formed quickly in northern cities and began training for war. Lincoln received a different answer, however, from the border states between North and South. Virginia's governor said he would not send troops to help the North get control of the South. North Carolina's governor said the request violated the Constitution. He would have no part of it. Tennessee said it would not send one man to help force southern states back into the Union. But it said it would send 50,000 troops to defend southern rights. Lincoln got the same answer from the governors of Kentucky, Arkansas, and Missouri. For several days it seemed that all these states would secede and join the Southern Confederacy. Lincoln worried most about Virginia, the powerful state just across the Potomac River from Washington. A secession convention already was meeting at the state capital. On April 17th, the convention voted to take Virginia out of the Union. Virginia's vote to secede forced an American army officer to make a most difficult decision. The officer was Colonel Robert E. Lee, a citizen of Virginia. The army's top commander, General Winfield Scott had called Lee to Washington. Scott believed Lee was the best officer in the army. Lincoln agreed. He asked Lee to take General Scott's job to become the army chief. Lee was offered the job on the same day that Virginia left the Union. 